Hi. I want to tell you about three big changes that I've seen in my working life. The first one happened in the early 1990s when I was working at Polygram, which is a big record company made up of many record labels all under one roof. Polygram was owned by Philips, an electronics manufacturer based in the Netherlands. And they, Philips, were the inventor of these compact discs. They are also the manufacturer of these. That is the, actually the very first CD player ever made, and it was made by Philips. And their idea um, was to buy Polygram because they would supply the product that went on the CDs that would make you buy more of those CD players. It's called vertical integration, where you buy up other components of your distribution system. So Philips also made these. VCR players. And if the theory holds true of vertical integration, then these VHS tapes needed something to go on them to sell more of those VCR players. So the theory would be that you would buy a big film company, but film doesn't work any way that the music industry does. It might cost a couple of thousand dollars to make a CD, but a film costs millions. It's a really consolidated industry, and there are very few movie studios, and they're very expensive. So Polygram and Philips couldn't just go out and buy a film studio. So they did something different. They went out and bought lots of little ones, six or seven small production and film companies that made specialized products. <clears throat> And they did something that was kind of different for the 80s and 90s, which was a time of mergers and acquisitions. During that time, lots of companies were getting bought up by bigger players. They would strip it of its assets, cut its leadership, and dump all the assets at the end. It was a brutal time in business for small companies. But Polygram didn't do that. They invested in the leadership of those little companies. They kept all the heads of, of those companies. They kept them where they were, no matter, regardless where they were. They didn't put them under any roof. And they invested in that product and nurtured it to see what would happen. So one day, I was at my desk. And a, film came, uh, a script came across that said it had gone into production in London. And I read it, and it was so good. It was the best script I'd ever read. It was literate and funny and gorgeous. I was shocked. And a couple of months later, we got invited to a screening, a rough cut of that film that was made from that script. And you know what? That film was even better than the script. Mm. It was crazy. We all wanted people to see this tiny little movie, but it had no stars. It had no shoot em ups. It had no explosions. It was not something that was going to play on a big screen. But we are going to try. Back then, there's this formula. I won't explain it to you, but I will tell you that this was a formula. Brutal as it was, you needed $5,000 per screen average to open a movie. If your movie opened at 5000 or more, you would put it into more cities and open it broader. And if it was under 5,000, you started shutting it down, pulling it out of the theaters, and gone. Didn't matter what the reviews were, didn't matter what anybody thought of your movie, you needed that $5,000. That's what it was. So this movie got released on a Friday. And on Monday morning, you got your numbers. We all huddled, up, huddled around one of these. <laughs> <laughs> on Monday morning. And we're all pulling for this little movie, saying, 5,000, it's got to be 5,000. And the machine started spitting out the paper. Chug, 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 chug. <laughs> and when we saw it, it said 50,000. I thought, that's weird. It can't be 50, it's got to be a typo. And we went back to our desks, and the LA called about an hour later. And they said, you know what? It's real. It was 50,000. We've never seen anything like that before. It caused chaos. We didn't know how to release a movie like that because those numbers didn't exist before. So we had to get films print struck, which take place in giant factories. They took giant wheels of film and they put them into things that looked like this. 
the ridiculously heavy canisters that have to get mailed and shipped and get them to a theater, all within Monday to Friday. It was nuts. But we did it. And then Monday morning, that following Monday, we all huddled around the fax machine again. Chuk, 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 chuk. chuk. It said 50,000 again. We were standing in the middle of the biggest independent film of all time to that date. It didn't look like anything that had ever happened before. It was a massive change. And this little movie is called Four Weddings and a Funeral. Oh, yeah. It made a star of that guy, it was Grant. But it did something really revolutionary. It changed what the big companies were doing and made them act like small companies. They learned that they needed to take out their thoughts and make a little division, a little boutique center in their film to create these independent movies, nurture these scripts, work with smaller and stranger stories. And this little movie changed the way that the big movies did their business. And it remains today. We take it for granted today. It didn't always work like that. So that was change number one. And it was a gorgeous kind of change. So change number two also happened when I was at Polygram. At that time, I worked on the 19th floor. And the way it did business was, if I needed to get a memo to the 20th floor, I would print out a piece of paper, I would put it in one of these, <laughs> into, into, into office envelopes. That would go into one of these, a mail bin, it would get picked up by one of these, a mail guy. The mail guy would take it to the basement. They would sort it there the next day it would get delivered to the 20th floor. It literally took 24 hours to move a piece of paper from the 19th floor to the 20th floor. Crazy. One day, that guy delivered a memo to my desk, and it said, come see a demonstration of the internet. I was so excited. I heard of the internet. I read about it. I couldn't see it before. So I thought everybody in the company, from these 24 companies, would go to see it. I went upstairs so excited, and I was looking for this big room, and you know where the internet de um, demonstration was? Wow. In a closet, <laughs> a little closet. And you know how many people went? Two. Three. <laughs> I didn't run them What the internet guy was telling us was that he showed us a promotional site for this, the George Clooney Batman movie. That actually happened, nobody remembers. <laughs> but what he was showing us was the promotional site for that. And as this Gotham skyline chugged across the screen on a really slow dial-up connection, <laughs> jug, 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 <laughs> he said something that changed me. He said, the one thing about the site is that it can be seen everywhere in the world all at the same time, in China and South America, in Europe, we're all looking at this at the same time. And for someone, for whom, it took 24 hours to move a piece of paper from 419 to 420, that was a big idea. So, I went later, I moved over to a company called Scholastic, the children's publisher. And I went into the internet division. And people said, you are crazy, you're going to ruin your career. They were used to selling books in the old way, right? That was just how things worked. Within traditional companies, people were really resistant to this change. They did not like the internet. They started reading about it in a fearful way. That change wasn't managed either by the management of those companies, who were also scared of it. Nobody knew what to do with it. How would you know? It was different. The dot-coms, though, were surging, and fear was getting worse. I later went over to Nickelodeon, and things were the same there. People had waited too long. They didn't invest in that change of the internet. And what the internet ended up doing was just replicating what was already happening. People were angry inside of those companies. A lot of people lost their jobs. And a lot of the opportunity of the internet was lost because that change was not managed in a profound way. It wasn't invested in in a smart way that could have rolled in over time. Instead, it happened at the last minute, and it was ugly. So that was change number two. Change number three, we're sitting in right now. 
The first time I saw it was when we started working on this something called the Creative Economy Project in the Capital Region. It's a reconsideration of this of the arts and culture segment, and it rolls it in with a bunch of industries that are new and creative and changing the way that business is done. So arts and culture is now teamed together with film and media and digital gaming, industries like that. And when we took that definition of the creative economy and applied it to the capital region, we found out that it was the sixth largest employment sector in the capital region. We're totally shocked. Nobody had ever even used that term before. Now it's the fourth largest employment sector. It's bigger than the construction industry. Shocking. But that isn't even the change that I want to tell you about. Within that data, there was this other data point that said that over half of those in the creative economy are freelance. As a marketer, half is a weird number. Half of any group doesn't happen very often. We started digging into that number, and it turns out that freelancers represent 25 to 35 percent of the U.S. workforce right now. And it is predicted to be 50 percent of the U.S. workforce within 10 years. So if we look around at each other in this room, half of us here will be freelance. That's a big number. And we have to take a moment and decide how that's going to turn out. The early indicators are this that most people that become freelancers, like me, are happier when they do so. Their job satisfaction is higher than it was when they were traditionally employed. Over 50% of millennials, and there's a lot of millennials here tonight, prefer it. They love the autonomy, they love the independence, and that is a, their chosen way of doing work. So what are we gonna do to make sure that this change looks more like change number one than change number two? I think there are two simple things that we can think about. One is benefits. Something that changed and rolled this whole change in very nicely and got it started was the Affordable Care Act. I don't care what you call it. I don't care what the politics are on it. You have to have it. This is the way that people are going to keep themselves healthy. That half of the people in the room that are going to be freelance, we need you to be well. It creates good communities. We also need you to have retirement benefits. We need you to be able to take vacations. We need that kind of life. The kind of life that traditional people have, traditionally employed people, we need those benefits for freelance people. We can do that, portable benefits, it would be easy. The second one is wages. Wages for freelance workers work really differently than traditional people. They have to pay their own benefits, right? Comes right out of their pocket. They have to pay for their own office. They have to pay for their own education and re-education and training. They have to pay a self-employment tax of 8% on every dollar that they make. So we have to think about how much we want to pay each other in this room, right? We have an opportunity with this internet creation to bid out this work against people who do not have the standard of living or, or the lifestyle that we have here. We can invest in each other by paying freelancers what they should make, right? How much it really costs to do that hour of work. If we are willing to pay that, we are investing in each other. We're creating the community we want to see. We're giving people the jobs that they want, that millennials want, that I want. That we can do by working together. That's not too hard. Over 94% of the jobs in the United States of America are in companies of five employees or less. Every one of those companies was started as a side hustle or a business, right? Someone working on the side. Because that isn't just the way that people go into it. It starts like this. It looks like us. Those are the kind of jobs that don't disappear when someone click, flicks a pen and moves a manufacturing plant from the United States to some other country. Those jobs stay here. They're in the smallest communities, right? These five people or less. This is a gorgeous way to do business. It's the way that we stay in the place where we want to be. We get to decide now what that change is going to look like. Is it change number one or is it change number two? 
I hope that you choose change number one. I think we can do this. Thank you for listening.